Um, and to this afternoon, we've got a, a really interesting presentation from Pasha Clothier, who is based in Taranaki in Aotearoa. And I've known Pasha for many years uh, through the organisation Intercreate and he's the executive uh, director or creative director of research with Intercreate. Uh, this afternoon, he's going to talk to us, though, about something closer to his own ancestral connections, and he's going to be talking to us around uh, themes to do with Polynesian wayfinding. And I think this is actually so timely, this subject, actually. I was uh, realised that it's the equinox today, um, yes. So the stars are really important. So all of us around the world, we're all having the same amount of daylight today and night time. And it was also a full moon this morning. So it seems very timely to be talking about the planets and the moon and the stars. So um, just before we begin, I would just also like to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the unceded lands of the Nunamal people. And I would like to acknowledge um, elders past, present and emerging and would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of any people who are with us and also to Pasha and his uh, connections. Um, I'd like to make that acknowledgement as well. So I'm going to turn my camera off and Pasha, it's all yours. Ah, okay. Um well, I will first introduce uh, myself in the way that we do in this land of Aotearoa. Um, ko whakapapa i hiti o reiwa reiwa. Uh, Mawatua vahinia tua ki taio nga tupuna a hunga waru. Uh, mahi toi ote. We say, ahu. Uh, I've just said that I'm an eighth uh, generation descendant of uh, of the island of Hiti Arabia Waiva, which was colonized as Pitcairn Island. And uh, my ancestors are the Tahitian women. Um, Hiti Arava Rava is the Tahitian name for Pitcairn. Uh, and they were tarpa makers. So I see myself very much in line um, with this heritage. Uh, uh, I'm also what is called Mahu, which is uh, the third gender. It's like it means literally in the middle and and I feel myself as weaving uh energy. I'm just going to switch off my um my camera now. Uh, we have a few problems uh, sometimes here. Our, our transmission tower is up on a mountain, and when the when the clouds are swirling around the mountain, um, we sometimes have issues around um, around connection. So um, I did want to list the rail or the Maori language for Polynesian navigation, which would be Fakateri. Te Moana Nui Akiwa. And there is some um, uh, reticence around using the word Polynesian because Polynesia doesn't really exist. It's three lines drawn in the in the Pacific Ocean or in Te, Ma te Moana Nui Akiwa. And then uh, it's, it's a kind of a colonial implant, but then customarily everybody knows what area that is so it's still used it's still used by many of the of the peoples of polynesia as well i will have to say that uh the other thing is that the polynesian navigation for me is a journey um you know up to this point i'm a person doing a phd that can read and remember pdfs uh, i'm in touch with um a hawaiian bearer of knowledge who i will soon be going to see 
and uh, also a Tahitian navigator as part of this duty of mine. But I know some things, and by the same token, um, I don't know very much, and I have to acknowledge that some of the people that I'm in communication with actually, you know, jump in a walker, jump in a canoe, and, and sail it for thousands of kilometres, which is incredible. Um, I'm also involved with Tracy in Intercreate, and it's always been Intercreate's view. We held our first event in 2006. Um, but we've always had the view that the resolution to the climate crisis uh, necessitated engaging uh, with Indigenous peoples and having a conversation. And of course, now we are in the situation where that is extremely necessary. And not only that, we must grant um, Indigenous peoples uh, leadership roles in resolving um, the environmental crisis. Lastly, I am involved with uh, uh, an education facility called the Learning Connection. I'm the, uh, I'm the program coordinator of Level 7, um, which is uh, culturally affirmative, particularly around in Indigenous groups. And uh, yeah, so it's all that I'm talking about now, it's all kind of tied into things I've been doing over the short and uh, medium terms. So let's get into it. Now, um, this is a map of, uh, of the Pacific, Te Moana Nui Akiwa. It shows the, um, the, the movement of uh, and settlement um, of Polynesia. Now, basically, we're looking New Guinea, uh, which is just north of Australia there in the Philippines, settled about 20,000 years ago um, into Fiji by around 13 BCE, Tonga um, by 1100 BCE. And Samoa and the Marquesas over on the right hand side by 500 BCE. So it needs to be realized that um, this is about 2,200 years, that the settlement of Samoa and the Marquesas, 2,200 years before Cook's voyage, which gives you some idea of the magnitude um, of the sailing capabilities of, uh, of early Polynesians. Now, not only did they have these navigational skills, but as we can see from this chart of the, the equator, the large scale currents, they actually had to sail against the, the predominant current um, in order to do the settlement they were engaged with. So really uh, quite incredible. I should say that these currents come in these main large currents and then in a sort of middle scale and a small scale as well. And it's all three of those forms of currents uh, that uh, navigators engage with. Sorry about the rakish angle of this one. I just wanted to make sure I got all of this waka or va'a in. It is a, a an actual one in, in the Otago Museum, um, w which is uh, an outrigger. It's a that's a, a Tahitian um, craft. Um, the, this one here, you can see on the right hand side. There's a very distinctive twin sailed uh, double hulled waka. That is a va'amotu. Uh, once, uh, once you had a sail on, on top of a waka, um, that basically was an in indicator that it was used to uh, travel distances. And then some, uh, some fishermen did actually travel quite dis long distances um, to go to fishing grounds and that sort of thing. But you could also navigate between islands. Va'amotu, motu mean, means island. And then the next kind of, these are large um, double hulled waka, that's called a waka horua or va'a horua. Um, you can see that there are, there's a, a, a base in the middle there, which would have been for the storage of supplies. Also places where people could huddle when the weather was, uh, was extremely bad. And these actually were, these are migration canoes. Um, the migration workers, that is what people would have been 
uh, sailing around Te Moana Nui Kiwa um, for thousands of years. But then one of the other things about all of these waka is, is that you can you can tell from which island they come based on the the sail shapes. Um, you can see they're a kind of family of shape. There is a is a sort of a recognition of similarity there. They're also quite uh, distinctive as well. And quite the Tahitian shape, which is my heritage, uh, quite unusual uh, in, um, in in structure and form. But I guess we're now going to dip into uh, the the sort of core part of the presentation um, by asking the question: What is uh, Polynesian navigation? Because uh, it is not straightforward. In the first place is an expression of an interconnected world view. Um, the idea that everything is is connected and interconnected. The whole of the cosmos, the whole of us as people, the whole of the planet, the whole of the land, the whole of the sea. It's all part of one thing. So Polynesian navigation is not really about going from A to B. And then that's really sort of important um, to remember and to understand. It's, it means far much more uh, than a progression from one point uh, uh, to another. Now, the other thing is that some of the knowledge around um, Polynesian navigation was at the highest level of society, the highest level. And then so Tupaya was a very famous um, navigator. Uh, he met uh, Cook uh, on Cook's uh, first voyage to, to the South Pacific. And he uh, went along and um, he went with Cook and travelled to Aotearoa, New Zealand. And then when he arrived there, it was discovered that Tupaya, who was Tahitian, could speak directly um, with Māori. There were small differences in sort of like what dialect, I guess, you is what you'd call them. Um, so they're able to communicate directly um, because it hadn't been known. Yeah. But anyway, so that's that goes back to the 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 waka, the va'a journeying uh, from Tahiti to to Aotearoa, New Zealand. So Tupaya was quite a famous um, navigator. He produced a, a map of the, of, the, of the Pacific with all of the islands on it, but he was, at, he was also a priest. So he was, a, he was somebody who held the traditional knowledge, all of the traditional knowledge. Um, yeah, so, okay. Uh, so certainly um, the whole cosmology of the Polynesian worldview uh, comes into play. And then that scale is uh, from, uh, you know, the, the sort of planetary scale, uh, the sun, the moon, the earth, um, all the way down to the scale of uh, very small insects and, and bugs. Um, which is most of what we think of as the reality that is um, available available to us. I'll get into some of the detail around this, but yeah. So uh, certainly um, one of the ways that uh, navigators would set their course was through um, uh, the position of the sun and the stars, particularly when they were low to the horizon at, at either the end of the day or the start of the day. And uh, it's interesting because Polynesian navigators had developed, traditional Polynesian navigators had developed a means by which uh, you could know both your latitude and your longitude. So latitude is quite easily established because that's talking about being parallel with the equator, basically. Um, but longitude is actually is actually quite difficult to calculate. But what they would do would, would be they'd count the hours from the rise of the sun in order to uh, work out their um, their positions. 
So even even up to Cook's time, for example, most European navigation was solely along latitude. So if 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 the if a European ship wanted to go back to an island, it would sail to the to the latitude that they knew that island was on, and then it would sail along that latitude until it bumped into it. That was that was how they did it. But yeah, the position of the stars, particularly their configuration. Um, are, are close to the horizon uh, is an important part, of, I guess, of of wayfinding. And then part of this, the traditional knowledge is actually knowing what the stars are doing. Um, and then there was some quite extraordinary awareness and understanding of of stars uh, and in their orbits on behalf of some of these traditional um, methods. Uh, currents, um, as I mentioned, are really, really important. Um, Marshall Islanders, they, they, everybody I think can probably produce in their mind a visualization of, of uh, Polynesian stick charts. Well, these, these charts in the Marshall Islands, they come in three forms. One is for the largest scale currents. Right. Uh, one is for the currents that are, that occur at, at a sort of medium level, and then the third one is for um, being close to the islands that were were a target. And then, sort of interestingly enough, uh, you know, Marshall Island Islanders they do not take these charts with them when they go on voyages. What they're doing is they're creating a dynamic mind map, which is partially made of the awareness of these of the the the, the currents, partially made of the awareness of stars, partly made of the awareness of the sun, and partly made of a few other things that I'm going to get into. But it's this idea, this dynamic mind map, is the thing that let, that the navigator data listens to and observes very clearly while taking in all of the information from um, the environment that they're, they're situated in. Um, Nadu Pai, um, once you get close to um, an island, uh, you get um, secondary waves. That, that Nadu Pai is the, is the reo, the, the Maori language for for um, these kinds of waves. And then, uh, yeah, so for example, the Marshall Islanders, they can navigate between two islands 100 kilometers apart solely by observing the secondary waves coming off the island that they're aiming to go to. So that this is without being able to see the, see the, um, to, to actually see the island they're heading to, right? But they can read uh, read the the uh, the secondary waves, um, which happen. You see, when when a current flows past an island, that island creates a little bit of uh, a little. It, it disrupts the flow. The flow goes around that island, and then where it meets back up again, it gets all sort of chopped up. Um, and this actually is called. Um, oh, actually, uh, it's known as diffraction. I have an image later on as in this um, presentation, but it just so happens, as some of you will be aware, that diffraction is the leading topic of in in quantum theory um as given by uh professor karen barrard diffraction is a part of the nature of light of the nature of wave particle duality and the behavior um, of waves so it's extraordinary to find uh, something like an awareness of of wave action um part of the discussion of of contemporary uh quantum uh, theory um, today. How much of, it, of that is sensing the current, the different kinetic energies? Um, look, uh, it's yes, I guess some of it is, but uh, I it was my good fortune to actually um, 
uh, to travel on a boat um, in, and sit in between two islands. And then when you are at sea level, um, the, it's, there's actually quite a lot going on, right? So you've got the current, uh, you've got the tide, whether it's incoming or outgoing. Um, you've got waves hitting islands and bouncing back off the islands. There's, it's quite a lot to make out what's going on, but it's basically, um, it's perceptible, I think would be fair to say. The, the, um, the, it's the other components, it's the dynamic mind map of putting it all together. It's, that's just fed by what you're standing and watching in some circumstances, right? Uh, yes, the embodied awareness, yeah, the embodied awareness is across multiple dimensions. Thank, thank you for that point. I do get to a little bit of that later on. Now, and then of course, the other thing is, um, clouds. Um, you know, uh, you can, you can, you can observe, um, uh, clouds, uh, that are the result of, of, uh, weather interacting with islands. And you can read those cloud forms from quite some, some distance, which is sort of interesting. The other thing you can do, actually, um, is, you can, um, if you are a, are a navigator out on open sea and you see stationary cumulus clouds, you know there's an island there. That, that's, that you, you basically know that. It's actually one of the principles uh, of, of chaos theory, actually, the interference of, of flow. Um, so, and of course, some of these, some of the, the, the Polynesian, um, uh, islands are quite steep. They have, have volcanoes on them and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so, and then the other thing is that, you know, um, uh, people often think that navigation is all about, um, uh, is, is all about, uh, you know, moving through the seas. Okay, your local knowledge. I'm just trying to catch up with some of the chat when we know the, oh, well, Yes. Yes. So, um, uh, however, sometimes if you're a navigator, you actually sometimes get becalmed. And when you're becalmed, you, you can't go anywhere. There's, you have to just sit there, basically. And in this situation, you, it's quite possible to be becalmed for three weeks. Uh, we did have an artist sail to one of our one of Intercreate's residency events and couldn't take part because she was becalmed for three weeks. Well, when you're becalmed, you get to see, study, think, and reflect about cloud formations uh, big time, and then you also get to see, uh, reflect, and study stars uh, a whole lot of it. So that is also a um, part of it. Now, the other thing is that you're keeping an eye on uh, wildlife. So birds are really quite important to you. And then I was watching a, a video from the uh, the Wakahorua Centre at that's here in Kafia in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And the woman who was leading the uh, the workshop, she said this. She said, it's, it's late in the... Late in the afternoon, you know, the stars are not out yet, no clouds in the sky, uh, not much happening, and uh, you see a bird suddenly uh, rise up, um, fly really, really high, and then come back down again. And then she said, you are going to follow that bird, because what it was doing was uh, elevating its height so that it could get a visual a visual on the island and the place that uh, it was heading to. Um, the other thing is that um, migratory birds, the behavior of migratory birds is another indicator for, for navigators about um, about what's going on and where they might be. They're, they're, in, the, in the final session, um, a panel session with with Nina Segledi, the the chair of Intercreate, and Trudy Lane, who's a trustee. Um, 
Trudy lives near a, a migratory bird center, Pukoro or Miranda, it's called. And there was a presentation there where one of the birds that was was being tracked actually, um, for some reason, uh, did a really wide circle and turned back and came turned around and came back to Aotearoa, New Zealand. That was uh, our, that that tracked journey was overlaid with the with the wind currents at the time. It's quite clear that bird was flew around, encountered a storm, flew right around it and came back home. Well, if you're out on the water and you see a migratory bird flying in the other direction, you know that there is a, a storm ahead. Um, yeah, there are, there are more examples of, uh, of, of birds in their use. Uh, one of the other things is things floating in the sea. So if you come across a, um, a coconut and um, you uh, drink some of its water, you can tell by um, how sour it is, how old um, that, that coconut is or when it was last on the tree, which will give you a kind of indication about how far you are away from the landform that placed it there. So you're bringing all of these things uh, to bear. You're really alive to the environment. Uh, you've got experience of the sun and star positions, the, the knowledge of currents. Um, it's it's uh, you're looking at the birds, you're looking at the wildlife, you're looking at clouds, you're looking at whatever might come along, and it is very interesting um, if you if you throw a lightweight object into the sea, it will it will um, float according to what the dominant current is, not the most choppiest wave. It is really really quite an interesting uh, thing to to observe. Now, the other thing that is quite clear is this thing about um, patterns in nature. That's also been a kind of part of, of the building this picture of navigation, building the knowledge, uh, transferring that knowledge through uh, generations, uh, generations coming forward, um, and that these observation of patterns in nature um, are really quite striking. So what we're looking at here is um, these, um, the three red forms with the coloured, they're called ho, and then that's a waka paddle. So that what we're looking at is waka paddle decorations on the right hand side. And then I showed this to um, I showed this to a fluid dynamicist at the University of Auckland. He looked at it and straight away he said self-similarity. And it hasn't been, self-similarity has only been discussed in the last century in the West, he said. And then these are from Cook's first voyage, which is, uh, which is 1769. So the one particularly on the right, elements of, of uh, self-similarity is discussed in chaos theory, right? Well, over there on your left, this is called a von Kármán vortex street. It actually, it's a, it comes from an experiment in fluid dynamics. And then when I show it to, to Tanga to Whenua, to, to the people of the land here, I show them that and they just go, oh, call cool, fi fi. Uh, that kofifi is this patterning that I'm talking about, and it uh, eventually became. If you if you ever have the honour to go to a, to a, a meeting house of Fadi Nui in Aotearoa, um, the large ones have these decorated uh, panels called uh, kofifi. Um, oh yes, so um, the the. Koru uh, is, is, is a very famous, a very well-known structure and principle of, of Māori art, a uh, Māori, Māori visual, visual arts practice. So you can see it in the, um, various forms of it in these, in, in the, in the waka paddles there. Um, this is, uh, this is called, uh, Elvin Helmholtz clouds. Um, they, uh, they kind of occur, 
you know, that to, to, as defined as this, not so much, but you can see many, many variants where the, where the cloud forms are attempting to, um, to stand up. And so the point I'm making with, with these things of clouds is that sometimes when you were becalmed, you would have witnessed this kind of thing if you were out in the open sea. I have a, a number of photographs, actually, of them. This is, uh, this is Kelvin Heimholtz, but off the side of a mountain. This is the mountain under which I live, Mount Taranaki. And uh, it's, it was taken by a student in something like 2009 um, and really is kind of evidence of where this awareness of, of patterns in na nature uh, comes from. Uh, truly really striking. You can see here there's a, both the coro and a spiral, which are, which are very well-known forms in, in Māori art. And then uh, this slide here, remember when I was talking about the fraction? Well, the right-hand side of where the, the waves are interacting, that is diffraction. So this is actually... Um, quantum theory. This is uh, this is uh, wave light duality being discussed here. In particular, the behaviour of waves. The same thing being referred to um, uh, as Naru Pi. And of course, uh, Polynesian navigators are not really looking at the scales of quantum theory, but they are looking at the scales of reality. And what they're finding is uh, some similar things. Now, certainly, Polynesian awareness does include um, uh, does include the idea of scaling. So that is, that is a feature of it. I think it's important to observe these differences between the, the knowledge uh, systems. So the scale, as I mentioned, of Polynesian awareness is more like from insects to planets. It's a very interesting discussion in its own way about this awareness of planets, but certainly Polynesian navigators were aware that the Earth is curved. So, you know, when you're a Polynesian navigator, you're not going from A to B. Your idea is that your craft is stationary and you're going to bring the island that you are aiming for over the horizon towards you. So, and then certainly, if you're sailing, um, if you're sailing uh, a few thousand kilometres over the ocean, you will become aware that as that that we lived on a, on a curved space. It doesn't take a great deal of speculation um, to figure that that's probably uh, a ball in space. Um, yeah. So. Right, so um, I wanted to to end um, with with this slide here. Um, when I spoke of uh, an interconnected world view, um, this chart here um, is uh, a, an interconnected um, world view. Uh, the person on the right is Dr. Tahuri Rangi Waikiri Puru, who sadly um, passed away. Uh, in 2019. Um, he was the Komatua with whom uh, Intercreate worked on many projects. The reason why we uh, uh, had um, five or uh, six um, events with Y or water or flow in them was due to the influence of the Hurirangi. Um, I'll just point out a few things in this chart. So down the bottom, you can see two and elements of natural law. Um, so you have Tane, well, there's Rongato for peace, Tane for land life, Tanganoa for water life, etc., etc., etc. You go up one level and you go to the level of Whakapapa, which is Genealogy. Whakapapa mean is basically genealogy. Now, um, it is well known among Maori that um, we uh, that that well they say they are uh, descendants of the stars. 
Now, this used to be rubbish, but of course, this is now exactly what um, contemporary science is saying, that it all, all boils down to the formation and the behaviour of, of stars, you know, 45,000 times as massive as our sun, etc., etc., etc. We are, in, in many ways, descended from the stars. Um, the next le level up is called Te Teo Māori, or the elements of the Māori universe. And if you have a look at what's up there, there is Wā, which is time, Atiya, which is space, Hihiri, which is energy, Theko, uh, which is matter, and Kitahi, which is interaction. So these are remarkable to, to this is a remarkable group to have at the level of elements of the natural universe. And then above this is the core, the potentiality, and the way to core maps out or the potentiality of all things um, is 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 again a, a piece of knowledge that's shared across this boundary of um, of Polynesian traditional Polynesian knowledge and uh, Western science. So I've actually uh, come to the end of the slides and think I can now field um, questions uh, if people have them. Okay. I think we've changed modes now so everybody can each other. speak. Yep. A couple of questions, Pasha, came through the chat while you were talking. Oh yes. Um Yeah. I one, couldn't sometimes couldn't get the window open enough, but anyway, yep. Yeah. One was um could you repeat the uh the word for Polynesian in language? I think it was right. Oh, the thing is, um, the the first word I I had on the first slide was fakateri. Now, fakateri is actually navigator. Now, when the the words that I used for Polynesian was actually Taimoana Nui Akiwa. Now, Taimoana Nui Akiwa is simply the words for Pacific Ocean, according to the Polynesian peoples. Yeah, so uh, that's, can I write it? Yes, can I get to the chat window from here? Yeah. Uh, add reaction, switch to content. Uh, oh, you might on. need to turn so, your camera on, Pasha. I oh, sorry? Oh. Oh, the chat window. Uh, yeah, where's the chat window? It's, it's on, on the, the bottom left. left. The little blue thing at the left. Okay, yeah. oh, there it goes. Good. <laughs> yeah, so. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, in, we, we would say to Moana Nui Akiwa here in Tahiti and um, in Aotearoa. But um, on Hawaii, it's actually Te Moana Nui Akiva. And then actually Moana is the name for sea. Or, and so Moana Nui is a big sea, a big ocean. Um, now, Kiwa was the, the person who is said in some traditions to be the person who first sailed across it. There are multiple stories um, of this of this kind, it has to be said. But yes, Te Moana Nui Akiva, or Kiwa. Marvellous. And that's Pacific Ocean, is it? Yeah, that's Pacific Ocean. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question that came in the chat was from Richard, was um, did Tupaya go with Cook voluntarily? Uh, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Um, it's look. There are speculations about why he voluntarily went with um, Cook. 
Um, but I don't know how definitive they are. But he certainly uh, did did want to um, take part. He wasn't wasn't press ganged or anything like that. I have read a paper which which was talking about oh, you know, he'd upset the chief on the island that he was at, so it was probably timely that he could you know head off somewhere. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But yeah, he seemed, seemed I think he was basically a really uh, bright person. And then the Cook did have a large impact when it arrived uh, in Matavi Bay in Tahiti. Um, so yeah, it was recorded as having two rivers flowing out of it. And then that was, um, that was the, probably the bilge pumps were working. More questions? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I um, think is um, Christine. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say your last slide, I th um, Pasha, it will set up. Um, Desna's talk really nicely tomorrow because I'm sure she'll yeah. go into uh, some more exploration of the Māori universe. So yes, yes. Nice yeah. One thing I would also like to say is that uh, that the chart in that form was was written by Huri Rangi um, for an exhibition in 2011 um, in Istanbul. And he, we gave it away freely because he wanted this knowledge shared. Um, so I felt it was okay here, and then I don't know. It's all right to share it in the in the presentations. Um, but yes, um, uh, yeah, that's a yeah. It's a really significant uh, document. If you do actually ever reuse it, please ensure it's in the whole form so that the two photographs are there because it's very important for people to understand that it's important for people to know that i am not the holder of this knowledge it's not my knowledge it's actually belongs to tahuri langi waikiri puru and to inaha um to uratahi waikiri puru um but they we would like it out and then the other thing is that huri langi always claimed that that chart contained pre-colonial knowledge he was, he was quite strong about that. He was a very special person. He was separated from his family when he was a young child. Um, if in Maori culture, if you're a child and, uh, and people uh, become aware you have certain skills, they will channel you in a particular direction. Then Hurirangi was separated from his parents and went to live on a marae where he could be inculcated with all of the old knowledge. So he was an extraordinary um, bearer of knowledge from the traditional times. Uh, and he was renowned nationally in the in the country because he led the recognition of Rayo or Maori language being an official language of Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, that actually led to the um, to Maori radio and eventually to Maori television. So he was very important in that. Um, Christine um, Deegman, I think yes, you are with us, and I, I see you made a comment here on the Great Lakes. We call this local knowledge when you know the waves and winds and depths and shallows and interacts. Um, so which side of the Great Lakes are you on? Are you on the Canadian side or the US? Right. I'm in the US, uh, okay. close, to, close to the Canadian border. I'm in the northern area of Lake Michigan and Green Bay. Okay, and so, and so how did you become aware of this local knowledge? Or is that just knowledge you've accumulated through being local to the place? Um, well, it is knowledge being local to the place, and I became aware of the term. Uh, my father um, was a sailor, 
and um, spent a lot of time on the water. So I learned how to uh, read the waters from my father. Um, so that's one of the special things for me here. And so the local knowledge uh, where, the, where we're situated is um, amongst the Niagara Escarpment. So there's very high 200 feet you know, oh, limestone uh, formations yeah. everywhere. So those affect the, um, the winds. And so primarily from sailing, um, knowing the local, you know, having local knowledge will help you in your sailing skills, for instance. But there's yeah, also sure, the sure. confluence of a, a bay, Green Bay and Lake Michigan have a confluence. And so what you're talking about with the, the um, disturbed waters, um, where oh, that yes. confluence happens and around an mm -hmm. island there. Um, it's very yeah, hard to yeah. read unless you know, yeah. Unless you know, it's like once you once you get your eye in, as it were, then you can see it all going on. If you kind of know what you're looking for, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you, uh, I learned to read the waters. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it's like a, a new a new a new book or something. <laughs> Thank you for asking. So, in fact, uh, this. Uh, Pattern recognition college, uh, uh, knowledge is em embedded in nature, so it's always available. But the risk is the loss of biodiversity because, for example, if you lose the birds, then you shrink your pattern recognition knowledge or possibility, right? Yeah, it's um, yes, that's right. It's the and um, yeah, we're, we're life is becoming more and more poor for people who are paying attention to species. Uh, very, very true. And then that's one of the tragic things about um, about climate change that the impact it's having on 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 wildlife. Absolutely. And then I think that's leading to a lot of lamentation on on behalf of um, indigenous groups. But I do think that if we can provide more context to be engaging um, with the kind of approaches they have to the environment, we could get somewhere. It's a very difficult problem to work with, as I'm sure everybody is aware. We seriously need some 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 appropriate leadership from from some from Europe, from the States, from China, uh, from Asia. You know, it's really really important that we get our act together now. Um, and then, yeah, so it's there are all sorts of changes um, uh, just even in in my backyard here um, over that, that are climate change related issues. You know, we I live in a house that's surrounded by trees and in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we sort of have a, an extraordinary amount of space and we, we all our houses are bungalows which which so you know they're all single story with with uh, you know patches of bush on either side um it's extraordinary but the changes here have been quite phenomenal when i first came here there used to be one part of the lawn that actually got um a little bit of frost on it doesn't get it anymore and then just this just this winter you know, I'm getting a bit off topic, but just this winter, I've actually had to water the garden in winter, which is the, like the first time I've ever had to do it. We had the warmest winter on record ever here. Um, and then there's been dramatic changes in the in the bird life and the bees, um, really noticeable. Quite quite sad. I I, I plant a lot of um, flowering uh, plants. They love like, they love lavender amongst other things. Um, but just nowhere near the numbers, nowhere near the numbers. Mm. I noticed a I'm comment sure. in the Not chat. Really comment, but more like an observation. I'm sorry, Gert. I saw no, a comment okay. in the chat. <laughs> 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 about um, the ancient Greece uh, from Gita and I just how they navigated the stars and I just wondered um, Pasha you know you had have also yes. been doing some research into the ancient Egyptians 
Um, yes. Do you want to share any of, of that or is that still under wraps, that work that you've been doing? It's it's yeah. not an it's not yeah. an entirely yeah. under wraps. Um I think um this um you know this this group of people here, it's probably worthwhile um to hear. And then one thing I will say is that um in the oral histories of the Cook Islands and the Rara Tongans um, is uh, someone who is actually believed to be an actual historical person, and his name is Maui Maru Mamau. Now, one of the things Maui Maru Mamau was reputed to have done was to have sailed across Te Moana Nui Akiwa to Peru. And he described um, the landforms on the coast of Peru. Now, there is a cave in Chile which has uh, petroglyphs in it. Those petroglyphs were translated by someone, a New Zealander by the name of Barry Fell, who was a marine biologist at Harvard University. Now, what what this says, what those, what these petroglyphs were translated, I have to tell you that this is slightly controversial because Barry Fell was a marine biologist and not an anthropologist or an archaeologist, right? So he was writing out of discipline and the community around him was really a sort of a fan club. So it wasn't terrifically peer reviewed, but nonetheless, uh, uh, Barry Fell produced uh, uh, the a translation of these petroglyphs, um, which are which I now um, which are, I now believe are Libyan. At the time, um, at the time we're talking about, which was two thirty three BCE, um, the ruler of Egypt was also the ruler of of Libya, and then. Uh, the Library of Alexandra was uh, run by a Libyan uh, Ratosthenes of Cyrene. Now, Ratosthenes of Cyrene is, is well known for um, well known for making a calculation on the circumference of the Earth around 240 BCE. That was correct. Okay, and then according to Barry Fell. Uh, the, the the petroglyphs inside this cave in Chile say that they are written by a person by the name of Maui Maru Mamau, that he was sent to sent by Ptolemy the third to um, test the calculation of the Ratosthenes on the circumference of the Earth. Now it is it is widely known. That Ratosthenes um, did actually make this calculation. Um, the drawings, the drawings that are in the caves in Chile, they would appear to be trying to explain the ways that were the means by which this calculation was being made. So, what I need to do, though, because of the um, because of the fact that Barry Fell was writing out of discipline, I'm really looking around for additional um, confirmation, perhaps from a Libyan historian or something like that. Um, I have been in touch with an Egyptian, uh, with a, a, a specialist in Egyptian um, history. Um, now, if that is so, then uh, first up, um, the the figure of Maui is in the um, in the oral histories of all Polynesian peoples, right? The the most uh, famous thing that Maui is known um, to have done is to have held back the sun. It's the most famous myth, right? So the um, the ancient Egyptians, like the Polynesians, had um, had they understood this thing that you needed to have a, that basically every year was three hundred and sixty five and a quarter days. In other words, that's the rationale for the leap year, right? 
Well, both the uh, Egyptians and the Polynesians uh, didn't have this sort of a regular every like February 29th, like like what we do in the current calendar. They had a floating position on it, which was based on when the most appropriate time according to the stars was, right? So if it's like August the 31st, and you have decided that you're going to put your leap day in the following day, what happens? There's a gap of a day, and then September 1st comes along. So that's my speculation. If it works out to be true, I believe the oral heritages of the, of the Rarotongan and Cook Islands community, that it seems to me that, that there's enough mentions of, of this figure. Um, one of the key mentions was by the former, uh, the ex prime minister of the Cook Islands, um, referring to Maui Maru Mamau. Um, so if I can get additional um, confirmation that this, this voyage was undertaken, then that would be quite a big finding and would have significance across Polynesia. But that would be an explanation of a number of things. Um, the fact that according to Tahuri Rangi Wai Kiri Puru, uh, the, the sun, the moon and the earth were in, in orbital relationships with each other. Um, he certainly uh, did believe that. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's that's quite um, exciting from the... Oh, yeah. She made a living... Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, true. Simone just made the comment about listening to the wind. Absolutely. Um, the Polynesian craft, you couldn't really see it in the images that I showed, probably, but... They had uh, strings, lines, which with little bundles of, of feathers on them that were trailing off the back end of the waka. And of course, any breath of wind gets picked up by the by a feather in the most, you know, instantaneous way. So it's a sign that that there are um, that there are winds afoot. Oh. Cartesian experience with the bind and body interact from what is experienced. Okay. Oh yes, that's right. Certainly smell. Um, uh, you could, there's an increase in the ozone um, in the atmosphere before a severe storm hits, a strong storm, and uh, that's that's directly perceptible. Absolutely. Yeah, smelling the weather big time. Yes, it is a multimodal way of knowing. It is poetic, um, uh, uh, Polynesian wayfaring. Oh, okay, that seems to be so. I'll put it there. They were much inspired by the river and ocean stars, bringing the stars on Earth. Yes, they develop a very developed mathematics. Yes, uh, yeah. The similarity is, is that the waters brought them to knowledge of the stars. Did this result? Well and soon. Yeah, uh, you know, I think if it's if it's correct, actually, what happened to this this Maui figure was that he actually got shipwrecked on um, on Hitiarava, the uh, very island to which I am uh, that I am uh, you know that I fuck a papa to. So um, yes, if he was there, he would have. He would have been found. Uh, Hitiarava Rava is one of the few uh, islands that has um, obsidian. Well, they just don't. Not all of them have obsidian. And then one of the um, one of the Rarotongan stories is that Maui emerged from a cave. Uh, there are caves on 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 Pitkin, on Hitiarava Rava. If he was there, then certainly there would have been a great transition of knowledge. Uh, all that, all that, uh, that you know, that certainly would have would have taken part. It would have been knowledge exchanged between um, between navigators. Um, if it does turn out to be, be confirmed, does the green.
Oh, um, the when there were when there were the big dust storms, and also when there were fires um, in Australia, um, you, they actually changed the clouds here. They changed the colour of the clouds. Um, I don't know what how far that would have been visible for past our Taroa, but yeah, it wouldn't be out of the question that that would be another queue if that was the um, certainly for the people around, you know, Papua New Guinea and the Philippines, the, what's called Micronesia. Um, I would say it would play a part. Yeah, I think um, also other Australians would know this as well, that the fires, the intensity of them were creating their own weather systems um, that mm -hmm. sort of added velocity to the, to the fire. I do have a question. Um, I was wondering with this... Um, you know, embedded, embodied knowledge that's been, you know, translated over such a long time. How does climate change change the reading of the of the waves and the water and the aspects of the wind? And how does that how does that become part of a if it is part of a new way of knowing? I'm I'm just really curious about that. I would I would say that there's uh, there's actually a sense of grief um, around the impacts of climate change. Um, I don't know. I'll I'll ask further about it. Um, I'll ask further about it to get a get a kind of a better picture of it. Um, yeah. No. The, the Everything is everything is changing, right? So the behaviour of Tangata Fenua, especially because I you know I see there's a kind of link up between climate change and COVID, and then so one of the impacts that this is having on Tangata Fenua, who are the the people of that Maori is actually a word that means person. Um, uh, it, it, you know everybody is a Maori, but Maori refer to themselves as Tangata Whenua, which is, Tangata is the people, um, the people of the land. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So there's the sense of grief, but also um, for Tangata Whenua, um, there's all there's this thing of being a good host. You're meant to be a good host. So actually, even when the constabulary forces arrived at the village of Parihaka, effectively to sack it, to, to destroy it, pull it apart, arrest all the men, um, the, the community actually sent out uh, wagons loaded of food to these to these soldiers in the constabulary there because you were meant, according to Tikanga, which is protocol, you're meant to be a good host. Well, um, many marae have stopped now welcoming groups of people onto the marae. The, the marae, the, the pa of Parihaka, um, traditionally since the 1800s has been having a day on, days on the 18th and 19th of every month where anybody was welcome to come, and that's stopped now. So this is quite a change, and then co that COVID is forcing this. And of course, COVID arises out of our relationship with the environment anyways, right? It's all about our interaction with species and that sort of thing. Hmm. Yes, about the change. They have identified particular changes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there's the level of what I'm talking about. Where if you're if you're someone who who grows uh, veggies, um, then um, you do have quite a few more cues on on climate change and what it's doing to to uh, plant life in your area. And then that is actually a feature of of Tangata Fenua and how they live. The prophets of Parihaka encouraged 
uh, encouraged uh, the growing of, of their own food. And to this day, there's quite a large um, communal garden there. Um, not everybody gardens in it that's in the community, but they all get to share the proceeds. But, um, yeah, there's a, a team there. Yeah, there is a bit of shaky network here. Stick maps, yeah, Marshall Island is embodied knowledge, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. That's this, um, yeah, there was a, um, indeed, there was a blind Marshall Islands navigator um, who just listened to the waves lapping against the hull. Phenomenal. I think um, it was really spot on what you were saying before. Someone said about grief um, yes. because I know that uh, I was read some articles about uh, some First Nation people in Australia that were mourning the loss of trees and um, after the fires there was, you know, I think most of us felt an incredible sense of grief and anxiety, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but I, I, I can't even imagine how that would be compounded for someone whose country has been decimated um, throughout that uh, weather event. Um, mm -hmm. And just on, a, on the point about climate change and changing environments uh, and biodiversity loss, um, Tyson Yonkaporta's conversation is really interesting. He talks about, you know, um, Indigenous knowledge is living knowledge. So it, it the the stories uh, and the explanation of the universe changes with the time. So it's it's not fixed in a time like dream time is a bit of an anathema um and he talks about that in in the presentation that that's following um which i think you'll find really interesting i thought it was fascinating what the the, the species in particular that he talks about i don't want to i don't want to do any more spoilers <laughs> otherwise you might not watch it but i was really yeah quite quite blown away by what he told me but yeah it's it's interesting because I, I totally agree with your point too around COVID. It was when it COVID hit, I, I had this deep sense of, oh, this is this is Mother Earth actually saying, no, nah, that's enough. Yeah, I've totally. had enough of this crap. <laughs> yeah. And you guys are going to pay. You know, it was felt like it felt yeah. like that. I mean, that's probably a bit dramatic, but, um, you know, there's definitely a causal link there. Yeah, no, I, look, totally. Uh, th this is that this COVID is the outcome. There are various papers on it, but it is the outcome of our relationship to the environment and species. The the pushing of species, uh, you're coming into greater levels of contact because the the areas for nature are being reduced and reduced and filled up by humans. Um, that's a really, really big um, cause for stuff like this. Um, yeah, so, and then this is right off the, and then climate change, the actual change in climate is only uh, exacerbating that. And it does go back to the fact that we really do have to, in our, in our daily lives, see that everything is interconnected. If we had the idea that everything was interconnected, we would have understood that when we were mining and taking fossil fuels out of the ground, we're actually, you know, crapping in our own backyards, essentially. Um, we just wouldn't be an exploitatory framework around the environment if we had have had the values of uh, Indigenous peoples uh, and also this, this notion that it was interconnected. So, I mean, look, you know, you and I, are, we're all connected by COVID now because of the impact it's having on all of our lives. So this is, a, it's a kind of another thing, really. It's a reminder that, yes, things are connected. You know, we had... Um, uh, we had one person with Delta come into the country, and I think there are up to 30,000 contacts now from one person, which is extraordinary because uh, that person had a test hours after being in the country and went straight and was in isolation when they were tested. <laughs> they were in MIQ. 
Um, but yes, we as people are incredibly connected. And then, of course, anybody who's living in, in main cities is even more um, interconnected with, with all sorts of people through transport, through the buildings, through, you know, everywhere you go, really. Um, <clears throat> so the lessons are there, but the, the you know, it's a horror story um, if we can't uh, get enough commercial interest to be self-interested enough to adopt sustainability in a sincere fashion. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, saw that the universe is a sea, yeah. I have, uh, let's see, that thing since it comes to the stars, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. One thing we should um, realise is that we now think of space exploration as, as the, the place of nothing. Well, actually, Earth, the exploration of the seas used to be the same because from the Western point of view, you didn't know anything was there. It led to a couple of bankrupt ideas like uh, terra nullis, the, the idea that land was unoccupied, which was which enabled Western colonizers to just grab it off indigenous peoples. Um, and then same as the, the ocean was considered this big unknown um, quantity. So, yeah, now we've just upped the scales, I guess. Um, yeah. So, as fluid as the sea was, and then the sense coming from the stars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, and then. If, sorry, you go. I was, I, was, I was going to just make the point that Hurirangi always used to that everything boils down to flow, that why was flow, the, the movement of energy from one place to another, and that this was a, a critical fundamental element of the whole universe, the whole of Te Teo. So these comments about, you know, water and space and, and stars and, and sun and all that um, really um, connect with this idea of everything being in a condition of, of flow. Uh, oh, I didn't gain a fuck oh, with a coronavirus. Okay, all right, yeah. So I can see the Bronwyn team four is talking about a coronavirus found in the abandoned mine. That's match, yeah, phenomenal. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes, the, the earth is round and the maps are flat. Okay, back to the thing. Once, it's more back to the Egyptians who seem an interest of research. With. Does that relate to your interest? Um, yeah, look, there's, you see that there are various interconnective points there. I did do all of this work with Hurirangi. Hurirangi always said that early Maori had a connection to the Egyptian region. And then why I have some time for these translations by Barry Fell is that he produced a chart that has like uh, Maori, Fijian, um, Hawaiian and Libyan on it. Now, that is truly honouring um, Huri Rangi's words and, and what he said. And then, you know, we all know, you know, often Papa Tuanuku is translated as, um, you know, Mother Earth, Earth Mother, but Huri Rangi translated it as Revolving Earth, which was a direct reference to the Earth turning. So I'm reading the, this, the, and, and actually how I stumbled on all this was I was trying to search online to find out, did, did traditional Polynesian navigators know the earth was curved? Because Uri Rangi is not with us, so I could just go and ask. Um, but yeah, so that's where that interest in, um, in, in Egyptians uh, originates. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, so that's really, yeah. 
Yeah, did the Egyptians cross the ocean? That well, unfortunately, the seven thousand scrolls of that were stored in the Library of Alexandria were, were destroyed by religious zealots. And then, so if there was going to be a place that had a record of this journey, that would have been it. But you would think that somewhere along the line there must be other other uh, confirming evidence. It's just. Um, some of it is some of these translations are remarkably correct like what the what this according to Maui Maru Mamau and what was written in the cave in Chile they were measuring eclipses because uh, if you measure an eclipse in three locations across Te Moana Nui Akiwa you can actually clearly establish precisely where you are because there's a very precise um, establishment of latitude and longitude. So you can know your position. If you know where you are and what time it is, uh, then you can then you can determine whether this calculation would be correct. And so the translator Barry Fell did not know that the 16th year of the reign of Ptolemy the third he translated it as being the 16th regnal year of the emperor well the 16th regnal year of Ptolemy the third um, who was known to Eratosthenes um, is 233 uh, BCE and at that time um, there were uh, there was an eclipse which could have been observed uh, in that year, December the 14th. So that's it's been confirmed in the astron in the astronomical tables uh, this, but we just need a little bit more of um, a little bit more of uh, you know further confirmation evidence just a little bit for before we go all the way out to the world with it. Uh, yeah, Cornelius. Yes, interested. Yeah, um, I'm going to develop it. So I'm looking at the, the, the thing about scale, the scale of these ideas, develop experience, from, and then can invite them to relocate as these majors. I mean, we're still from food, but really another, yeah, they are another way of being with the world, absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah, now, so I'm going to see um, uh, in late October um, someone who I had been having a, a conversation with around scales. She mentioned it in, in, in a phone conversation we had, and we've agreed to meet over a weekend. She's the bearer of traditional Hawaiian knowledge, um, Kawai Hululani. And then I'll be asking about that. So I guess that if I find out um, if I find out more things, it can be uh, <laughs> it can be uh, sent around to the community. I'm just looking at the yeah, the map is not the territory. The famous utterance from uh, from from chaos theory. Yes, indeed. We have evidence of connection to the um, okay. There are people who believe the knowledge travelled from. Ah, yeah, sure. Um, so, Aisling, is there any uh, knowledge around what sort of time are you talking about, or like how long ago, or um, before the Common Era, or in the Common Era, or or when? Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I think the best thing to, to do is that I connect you with these people directly because when it comes to linear time and stuff like that, it's like I I, I phase out and I kind of lose. So yeah, sure. yeah, it's like I, um, it. I, I I in terms of context with everything else that was happening, I get lost. Like so, but I I'll yeah. definitely I'll send those contacts to uh, Tracy and Tracy can forward them on to you because there's one specific lady who works with um she's a quantum physicist but she spent years living in. Egypt and uh, I travelled with her there and she's an Irish lady but now she's back in Ireland and she's very much on this whole whole idea of the, the Egyptian connection with the Irish culture and how the knowledge was travelled and passed along. I think we have the remains of uh, an Egyptian princess that was found here uh, I oh, think sure. there's beads and 
certain certain things that have been found within our passage tombs and stuff. So there is, I think, quite a lot of evidence to support um, certain from the archaeological point of view. And then also then from the spiritual quantum physics element as well, she can feed in the rest. Like. Wonderful. I, I pop my uh, uh, email address in the um, in the chat window and you're welcome to use it for that, that purpose. Um, yes, because there are also petroglyphs in Ireland. Um, and then, it, yeah, look, it would be very interesting to now look at some of the petroglyphs with some of the uh, of this these Libyan some of the Lib Libyan alphabet. It's really interesting that we talk today because, I, as I said in in my opening introduction, I'm living 20 minutes from a site which is a a mound, an ancient mound where the light comes through a passage on Equinox. And for the last five years, they've had a pillar stuck in the middle of it. So it's like, because they're trying to fix it, but they're not fixing it because I think they can't capitalize on the car park is what I've been told because that's <laughs> private land. Um, so it's, it's actually yes. beautiful carvings on the back there. And it's just to have this pillar now for five years been stuck in the way and twice a year for thousands of years the sun mm. the clouds have been away has had the ability to come in and do its thing for whatever reason I, I don't claim to know what the reason is but um it's just it's it's just quite shocking it makes me quite angry today and tomorrow and the next day um, and yeah. it, that it's blocked and not something like that Exactly, and then you know the, the contemporary the contemporary Western framework is that we that, that that you know this is the most superior time to be alive with the most advanced technological civilization, and then yeah can't get the basic basic stuffs right though, and then oh actually yeah right oh uh, did Polynesian. Oh, so the thing is, yeah, the uh, time, yeah, uh, the the, the nonlinear aspects of time were natural to the, to the Polynesian worldview, totally, 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 totally. Um, yes, no, multi-dimensionality and and the uh, the whole and all of that actually. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, there is a recognition of the nonlinearity of, of time, definitely. I guess that's what I can say. But yeah, and then there was the, uh, uh, yeah. So my experience never again the Western world stars and water coming out of space is like to go a new age. Yeah, but I and some of Yes. Interesting how this cultural cosmology for some people did not read. Yes. Yeah, no, it is. It is important that we everybody has to reconnect. We we need to reconnect with the environment and what it is. I mean, that's just it's really critical. And then we're we're partially subverted in that connection by being in the time of COVID, right? So we have to do connect in whatever ways we can. I um. I you know I was in a panel a couple of years ago which was themed around it, and I. I just kind of put forward, you know, we have to do everything. Do the little bits, do the big bits. Um, I say to people who live in 10 story apartment blocks, grow parsley. I mean, it's just really good to reconnect with, with natural, to see what happens, to see plants suffering when they're not watering, to, to see what they're like as the seasons go by, to see what they're like when they turn to seed and to see seedlings come up out of the ground. That can be done in tiny spaces. Um, this is why I live there. Yeah. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll just get that book. Oh, can you just download? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, go swimming, get back in the ocean. Oh yes, the tri spiral or spiral of life found on ancient Roman, ancient rock, Irish rock carvings dating back to twenty five hundred BC. Yeah, that's a very interesting. Um, I'm aware of that particular um, that form. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would, you know, I would think that as we as we 
become more aware of what some of the ancient civilizations were doing. After all, don't forget that it is the claim of the West that it was only since the Renaissance that, you know, the Enlightenment informed us that the, that the world was curved and not flat. Whereas um, what we're talking about here is an awareness of that for, for maybe a couple of thousand years before that. So, and then there's always been this sort of dismissive approach to to ancient cultures. Um, uh, well, that's really in the 20th century. The second half of the 20th century was actually one of the worst periods um, for the history of humanity and our relationship to the environment, because essentially, as what many writers like Hook Wei. Um, uh, have have written the separation of of uh, the taking out meta from physics, so you no longer had metaphysics, or in other words, separating science and ethics, actually led us into a position where we were able to um, exploit the environment because we no longer had an ethics around it. It's it's, it's sort of as simple as that, and at the same time. Um, uh, cultures, uh, you know, cultures that didn't have that view were considered more primitive um, and less intelligent. Um, so, yeah, you know, that was a real tragedy and has led to the situation um, of, of uh, you know, commercial gain being the, the main reason for doing things, which is no longer an appropriate um, approach, really. Oh, that's that, those are melons grown on the balcony. Woo! <laughs> Perfect. That's exactly it. Way to go. Uh, you mentioned um, terra nullius earlier, Pasha, and uh, um, another term's been coming up over the last couple of days: aqua nullius. Okay. About being denied yeah. the, the right to water, which I think has been very mm. powerful in the context of what we've been exploring. Totally, yes. You know, the loss of the right of water. I don't know if any of the audience live in California, but there are some really terrible things uh, that are being done with water in California where people are being deprived of the right to have water. I mean... It's really extraordinary um, that this is that this is happening, um, and one of the true crimes, really, um, of the denial of this basic human right to water. It's a big discussion point here. Um, there was quite a flare-up because there was a region, the region of Canterbury, in summer. Um, usually, the main river dries up, and then there was this you know, brilliant plan to, to bottle it all and send it off, you know, for a Chinese company to bottle the water as a as a commercial enterprise. I'm happy to say that it didn't happen, but it, if it hadn't been for the, uh, the controversy that was kicked up by members of the public, probably the powers that be would have let it happen. Um, really, really, uh, really criminal. Then the other thing, the other flip side of Aquinalis is just this whole thing of thinking that the ocean was a nothing. And then, you know, one of my Hawaiian friends says, you know, Cook discovered Hawaii with 300,000 Hawaiians living on it. It's sort of like, well, how do you, how do you call that a, how do you call that, um, a discovery? It's an extraordinary mindset, this, this one that's, that's been dominant in the, in the West. And it's really necessary that we work to get around it. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, it is. It's complex. Yes, what, then the contamination of, yeah, totally, totally. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's almost like a... You know, hard to know where to begin on on that uh, subject. It's that complicated. But if you want to uh, uh, contribute, some Christina, there, so you can you give us some more information about specific? Sure. Um, 
I can, you know, um, so California has such a complex uh, water um, system, primarily because the state is the state is so long and there's so many ecosystems. And so Southern California in the Central Valley um, is known for one of the biggest agricultural regions in the United States. And it's basically growing crops in the desert. And so in order to um, grow those crops, they have to bring water from Northern California about 500 miles away, you know, through a variety of um, conveyances, aqueducts and things like that in order to grow those crops. So, so there's a lot of uh, water imbalance in terms of where the water is going for agriculture, but also where it's going for, you know, human consumption and also environmental use as well. And there's, and, you know, we're in this enormous drought that they think now it's a mega drought which is the last big drought was in uh, uh, 2014 to about 2018 or so, something you know, around that around that time, but um, but it never really ended. So they they think we're in a mega drought now, which could last hundreds of years, and so um, and so a lot of people who are living, especially in the Central Valley of California, have completely run out of water due to um, climate change. And due to over um, pumping of uh, groundwater, so um, so it's a it's hundreds of people are living basically without water now, um, and their wells have been contaminated by nitrates from uh, farming and um, other kinds of you know large animal farming runoff and things like that. Did we lose Pasha? Mm. No, I'm still here. I just switched my, I was going in and out. So I just thought I'd try switching off the, um, switching off the video. Um, yeah, no, thanks for that. I'm aware of some of that. There was some, um, mm -hmm. there a video that I've seen online that deal to those issues and, and just the, the deleterious impact it's having on people. Um, and then I did, it was my great fortune to travel to Albuquerque in 2012 mm -hmm. uh, for an exhibition there. And we ha happened to be staying with some water consultants. And um, they they were saying that, you know, the, the, like the mindset of, of people and companies in, in the Albuquerque region is to have all these green lawns. And they keep them green by watering them every day. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I by... think one of, the, you know, one of the biggest problems is that the infrastructure for water in California was established, you know, a century ago when um, the climate was quite different. And uh, for instance, I, I remember somebody saying something the other day about the water coming from... Uh, underground well from different kinds of surface water from rainfall but california water depends on on the snowpack in the sierra so if there's no snowpack we don't get we don't have uh, surface water at all that's where it comes from and okay. so now that with climate change there's no snow and there's no snowpack so the the uh -huh. um water management in terms of groundwater it was unmanaged and so people were pumping groundwater at extremely high levels these high capacity wells to oh, water yeah. uh agriculture that that was um mostly being uh so it's very complicated but anyway the groundwater pumping for these large industrial farms was running people as well as dry so that so everybody who was living on their own um you know domestic well or community well was completely drying up because of over pumping of groundwater during the drought. Extraordinary, yes. It's terrible. Um, mm, and then actually just going to the comment about what led to the uh, the um, the mindset. Well the the whole enlightenment was this was this idea that knowledge was going to um, transform society. And there was embedded within that was this uh, a sense of entitlement on behalf of 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 uh, Western Europeans, basically, um, 
that really, because they were the holders of this advanced scientific knowledge, that they were therefore superior to anyone else. Um, so, yeah, that's very much what led, led to um, that colonial kind of mindset. And it's sort of, it's interesting again, because it raises the whole thing of it's the ethics around the uh, around the whole scenario that are being dragged into it. And then actually these presumptions around superiority are not really uh, tolerable in any setting at any time. Um, and then, of course, we're only getting to the places of um, events such as this one precisely because uh, people are becoming interested and tolerant of, of cultures and indigenous cultures rather than having this uh, superiority framework around it. So it's really critical that we engage with the events, you know, such as such as uh, this one, to have the the kind of conversations because we can all take this away and we can embed some of this into all of the activities that we're involved in. Some of us will be teachers, uh, you know. Some of us will be working for companies that are maybe aligned to this. Um, we it needs to all get out. Um, and to the to the more people, um, the better. Um, yeah. So I see this as very much um, the kind of event that is actually making a positive contribution in this whole area. Um, it is growing. Uh, we had a recent um, we had a recent flare up of controversy here, where um, a group of um, oh yeah against nature, um, where a group of uh, academics um, at the University of Auckland wrote a, a letter to I think to a newspaper to say that Mataranga Maori, which is you know traditional well. Mataranga Maori, it's used for it's kind of like traditional knowledge, right? But they said it was not science. Well, you know, as we've been talking about with navigation, all that's going on is that the navigators are A, noticing a pattern, B, speculating about what might be causing that pattern, and then C, testing whether that assumption is correct. If it is, they run with it, and if it's not, they let it go. Well, that's essentially the scientific method. Anyway, these these uh, academics wrote this letter saying that, that Mataranga Māori was, was not science without even asking anybody uh, what Mataranga Māori was. And then in my, so they were completely actually uninformed about what they were talking about when they were supposed to be academics in the first place. And they were all of um, an older generation, as a matter of fact. Um, but I was glad that this all came out because it showed so much that, you know, uh, race Racial profiling is embedded in academic institutions in a country like Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, we've got that here. Well, you can only imagine that there are other countries that have it 10 times worse. Um, so for the first time, this racism was kind of exposed. And the, making these assumptions without actually interrogating them, without doing any academic work on them at all, is just pretty outrageous, really. Um, but that's what even today, this is 2021, leading uh, elderly academics at one of our leading universities, that was their point of view. So you, if you ask yourself, where does all this... Where does it come from, these, these terrible statistics about the disadvantage that Indigenous groups have? Well, there it is right in one of our main primary educational institutions. Yeah. Mapping itself. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I was just catching up with the... Um, the conversation about the maps yeah it's inherently biased 
Yeah, I guess it's it, well, it's it's a kind of uh, it's a kind of funny thing, isn't it? Because um, in the case of the um, stick charts, um, they're not so much. I mean, that's a different mindset around map, and then, but yeah, the what what is in the comment about imposing lines and boundaries on them that are not there. Uh, that is a that is a critical factor of the colonial experience. So, for example, you know here in Taranaki, in the time of uh, in the time of uh, Parihaka, which was after the eighteen eighties, um, the yes, the you know uh, surveyors would arrive and they wanted to slice up the land. That's exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to turn all the boundaries into into straight lines so that they all intersected as rectangles so that they could be sold off. And, of course, this sort of annoyed um, uh, Tangata Whenua uh, quite a bit because no no acknowledgement was given at all of their, um, of their views of the land. And it's well documented that, you know, there were some crafty Maori living at the time who did things like sold bits of land to people when they had no right or ownerships or claim to that bit of land. That was sufficient to, to give... Uh, the colonial companies, um, the thinking that they actually own these these parcels of land, all formed through this process of you imposing lines and boundaries rather than rather than uh, looking to the natural environment to see where a, a boundary would naturally lie. Um, and of course, for Tangata Whenua, the, the 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 boundaries were all along the waterways. Um, the geological features, the features of the fenner of the land, um, rather than that, that sort of grid-like um, imposition that, that happened in, in settlements and, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and then, of course, uh, there's, a, you know, in, in chaos theory, that, that's where that thing of the map is not the territory comes from. It's, it's a compression of knowledge is is what you would say, and you can never have, uh, there's no, the one-to-one -one map is actually the reality that we live in, you know, it's not going to be possible to make a one-to-one -one map of Earth, um, because, well, uh, we, you know, it would, would take too much time and too much space to do it. Um, so every map is therefore a compression of of data and knowledge. And then I suppose what the um, oh, it's a cat. Um, I suppose what the um, what the Polynesians were doing was making the, a kind of a flexible flexible mind map that would allow them to get places. So it was an open ended map. It was like, yeah, it was. It's sort of like, you know, we think the map of Australia is finished now. Well, I don't think, it wouldn't surprise me if Aboriginal peoples did not think the map was finished yet. They're still, maybe still working on the map. Uh, okay. Well, the geology is always changing too. And, I mean, coming back to climate change, that's going yes. to change how the, the map is going to look if we're yes. thinking about it in in that in that kind of a way but it's constantly in flux isn't it i mean i often think of the map is also it's subjective to whoever's making the map even if it's a computer there's a abstraction from the you know from yes. the place um mm. yeah it has to read the place and then turn into a something Yes, no, I, it is. And then for some South Pacific cultures, or well, the cultures of Tama, Timor, Nui, Akiwa, um, actually coastlines are changing. And then if you're an island, actually you're mostly coastline. Yeah, that, that's what you are. You're a coastline, basically. Um, so, you know, there are lower lying atolls. Um, around here, there's all the places that, um, that, that flood or where the sea washes over the uh, the beaches, um, those are all areas which will be lost under under climate change. Yeah. Yes, and then um, 
Yeah, so uh, our, this coastline around us would change. Uh, some South Pacific islands are going to have to leave their islands. Um, there is a couple like that. Um, yeah, uh, so, and then the other thing is that, you know, we, you know, there's this tendency in the West to not see the landscape as moving, but if that it's not, that's not true for Tangata Whenua. So Tangata Whenua have this idea that the, the land and landforms move around, like mountains move around. You know, if we had a, if we could play a video of the last, you know, uh, 20,000 years here, we would see a liquid landscape. But we look at what we see now out the window and it looks like it's all staying in one place. Well, Māori just don't have that kind of belief. I'd just like to acknowledge the person who got the, got the macrons on the, over the A's in Mataranga Māori. That's Eve. Thank you for doing that. I don't know how to get it in the chat windows. Yes. I'm just gonna go. Um, I just want to quickly interrupt and give a, a bit of a call out to Kirsten Wainer, who's in the audience tonight. Um, Kirsten is the Director of Photo Access, which is one of our partners for the program. And, um, and we've been talking on not the last few months uh, about this project and the potential for it to do something after the program. Um, yeah, so really nice to have you and active in the chat as well, Kirsten. So, yeah. Thanks, Tracy, and I'm 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 sorry for just uh, mysteriously appearing <laughs> the a little bit late, um, and and for not being able to make the earlier sessions the last couple of days. It's obviously already an incredibly um, productive discussion. So um, yeah, a bit about me. As Tracy said, I'm I'm the director of Photo Access, which is the um, ACT and regions in Australia um, in Canberra, the ACT and regions Centre for Contemporary Photography, Film and Video and Media Arts, and where. Very excited to be partnering on the project and um, been having lots of great conversations with Tracy and Fred and Git about possible outcomes that we might support sort of after the workshops, um, thinking about how the map might evolve in all kinds of ways, particularly perhaps in relationship to the Murray-Darling Basin, which is, of course, you know, such a huge and complex and challenging um, topic for us here in Australia. So, um, and I must admit, I, I also, I mean, in my own sort of... Um, personal practice um, outside photo access as well. Um, I really am focusing on um, urban waterways um, and ways of reconnecting urban waterways and rethinking about people's relationships with water in cities. Um, so just so excited to be able to um, at least drop in and out a bit and, and be a, a sort of a minor voice in the conversation. But thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to have you here, Kirsten. Where's Pasha gone? Oh, I know. I just uh, I muted my um, muted my. Oh, you're back. Yes. Um. Oh, hang on. I'll go back to the chat window. So I'm, I'm aware that we're coming up to five to seven, which is five to nine where you are, Pasha. It is. So um, we, we might, if anybody's got any last questions, um, we might mm. pop them in the chat or just call out and ask them to Pasha um, and then we might let you run off into the evening. Um but look, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's been really interesting. I've, you know, been 
listening and tuning into your interest in in the um, research that you've been doing and how it sort of ties together with your ancestral past and it, it's great to see that in a presentation and also linking with some near and dear um, connections uh, through Intercreate and um, and uh, Taranaki. Um, yeah, so that it's yeah really interesting. Some yeah nice feedback coming through. Um, yeah, I was just thinking with the group though. After um, we wrap up this session, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping, if that's okay, for about five or ten minutes. Um, uh, because we've got also scheduled uh, Tyson Young Kapoorta a recording with Tyson. Um, we were set to show that at half past seven. Um, but I was actually thinking, and give me a thumbs up if you agree, that I share the YouTube clip with you and everyone can watch it in their own time before tomorrow, just because I'm very aware that it's coming up to dinner time. Um, yes, I can see one thumbs up two thumbs up uh, and also too we don't have the issue <laughs> issue with bandwidth that's been affecting us so I will pop that in the chat um, I've, I'm also trying to keep up to date with the with the information document so I'll add in what I can um, to that after tonight's session and what else I had some other um, and I had uh, also I added in um, resources from last night's session. So there's there's uh, all the articles that um, Brad Mogridge and, and Ross Thompson were talking about. Also in there is a video uh, from the session with um, Brendan Kennedy on Tatty Tatty Cultural Water that I mentioned last night with Melbourne University. That link's been put in there plus a paper that I thought would be really interesting for framing um, the discussion that we had talked about having uh, around ethics and cultural IP uh, and law and law. And that's by um, a, an environmental lawyer who's been working with uh, Brendan Kennedy. Um, her name's Erin O'Donnell. And she's written a paper about the right, the legal rights of water. Um, and some of the sort of complexities around that. So it's a very good paper. I encourage you to read it. Um, so that's in the list as well. And one of our speakers, Josiah Jordan, who uh, Pasha knows, and we both collaborated mm. with Josiah, um, he was going to present on Saturday but unfortunately he's he won't be able to present. Um, so I'm proposing that we use that session to talk about the law law um, and it gives me a little bit of time to maybe pull together some resources and gives you guys a bit of time to think about what we might want to talk about in that session um, because there definitely seemed to be some interest in us doing that. So that would be 5.30 uh, Canberra time. Um, on Saturday afternoon. Um, what else did I have? And I've got two other little things that I just wanted to show you, and I, I might need Fred to drop us back to the webinar. Um, oh, can, I okay? just, uh, can I just say a few words before we leave yes. the space? Yes, I just sure. want Sorry. to um, acknowledge Fred, Gert and Tracy for the work that they've done, you know, putting this together, and the um, also the conversation and the places we went as a group was just really uh, wonderful. I, I think there are going to be ongoing uh, things out of this, which I think that's really at the essence of heart of of get it bringing about change is is the continuity and and taking it from the the single instances such as one session and then putting it forward in other project activity that we will no doubt all be working on but it's been great to um to hear from from the people who have been in the audience and to get the prompts that you've put forward based on what was prepared it's, it's been a, a wonderful time and i'll certainly have a, a great memory of it so thank you very much all of you
<laughs> we don't have a clapping icon. <laughs> <laughs> but look thank you so much pasha i've really uh, yeah i've really enjoyed it and it's really stimulated some great conversation i really mm. loved your mastery over the chat window like all power to you <laughs> i think that that's there's a particular skill to that um and you know it's it's been a nice way of interacting and yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very and we will be seeing Pasha later um, with the Intercreate uh, crew, as as mentioned by Pasha, um, with Trudy and uh, Nina Segletti. They'll be talking more. Focused